I give you Professor Henry Bernstein and his lecture tonight, Class Dynamics of Agrarian Change, writing a small book on a big idea. Well, I'm completely unnerved by what uh, <laughs> Arun has just said. I don't know whether that was his intention. Um, first of all, I want to join in thanking David Morrison and Alina Heidlinger for their generosity in, in making the donation that endowed this lectureship that enables me to be here uh, today. Um, I also want to thank uh, the President, Stephen Franklin, and to thank Karim for their introductory remarks, and to thank all of you for coming here, uh, and not least the founding president of um, Trent University. Uh, it was my pleasure to meet him earlier. Is this going to be a problem? I think so. <laughs> Can I do it without? See, I come from a low-tech country where we are used to addressing large audiences without any such technical aids. I'm humbled to follow in the footsteps of such luminaries as Jim Scott and Diane Nelson in giving this uh, David Morrison lecture. Uh, both of them are friends of mine. Uh, Jim kindly wrote an endorsement of the book that um, Harun showed you, and Diane is also a former colleague of mine at the University of Manchester, where we established the PhD program in development studies in the early 1990s. Now, Jim Scott is an extraordinary scholar with a sequence of highly influential books to his name. I would add uh, to those listed in the notice of his lecture here in 2008, which I checked on your website. More recently, his book called Seeing Like a State, How Certain Schemes to Improve the Human Condition Have Failed, which was published in 1998. And his latest, and he tells me last major work, The Art of Not Being Governed, which was published last year, and which is subtitled an anarchist history of upland Southeast Asia. And I'm glad that he put that in the subtitle of his final book because it's been clear to me ever since I've known him that Jim Scott is an anarchist, sociologically as well as philosophically, uh, but for those who didn't realize it, he says it in the subtitle of his last, or his latest book. Diane Elson, of course, has been in the vanguard of the massively important intellectual and practical project of creating a feminist economics. Perhaps what is less well known is that earlier in her career, Diane also made important contributions to Marxist economics. So the notice for her lecture here last year noted, quote, her ability to move between the arenas of scholarship, policy advice, and advocacy, using her research to inform the policy agendas of non-government organizations, national governments, and international development agencies. Now, I present these little portraits of Jim Scott and Diane Nelson, both of whom I admire very much, because I feel that my, I am a somewhat different academic animal than they are. I'm a social scientist who's moved in and out of international development studies uh, at, at various times, whereas they are both outstanding scholars and Diane has also done very important applied work as was recognized in the notice for her lecture here last year. I consider that I've been primarily uh, a teacher and an editor. The most sustained work I've done is in agrarian political economy, as uh, Haroon mentioned, uh, not least in close partnership with Terence J. Byers, Terry Byers, uh, editing the journal of Peasant Studies, which Terry founded. Uh, we did that for 15 years together, and then started the new Journal of Agrarian Change in 2001, of which Terry and I are now emeritus editors, or as he likes to say, having had a classical education, editors emeriti. I retired a few weeks ago from teaching at SAAS, as been mentioned, and there couldn't be any better way of celebrating that event for me than this trip 
to Canada, made possible by the generosity of David and Elena and this endowed lectureship. Now, by happy coincidence, I just had a book published in Canada by Fernwood Press in Nova Scotia, uh, titled Class Dynamics of Agrarian Change. And because Haroon is so quick off the mark and knows, always knows what's happening before the rest of us, he saw the book before I did. But I have now uh, seen it. But in today's lecture, I want to talk somewhat about the process of writing the book and my preoccupations, my aims, my difficulties, and the sort of strategy I adopted in order to write it, and in relation to the big, indeed fundamental issues encompassed by agrarian change in today's world. And my impression is that awareness of those issues are, is very high in Canada, uh, and I'm, I'm, so I'm pleased to be able to, to talk to you about the process of writing the book. Now, it may be difficult for those unfamiliar with agrarian political economy to absorb all I have to say in this lecture this evening. But I try to make it as clear as possible, and I also hope, of course, that it may stimulate your curiosity about the book. <coughs> so, what was the challenge? Well, the book is the first of a new series of little books on big ideas in critical agrarian studies uh, that is a typically creative invention of John Boris, Satanino Boris, uh, a Filipino comrade, a former student of yours. Yes. So these circles go round and round. Um, the rationale of the series is to provide ideas and debates in a form that is accessible to activists in social movements and NGOs that deal with land and agrarian issues, as well as accessible to university students. So the prospect of writing this book was both exciting and daunting for me, maybe two sides of the same coin. It was exciting because it gave me the opportunity and the challenge of writing for a far wider audience than I usually reach. The audience I tend to write for is a specialist academic audience and an anglophone one. Uh, this book has just been published in Turkish and is also being translated into Chinese, French, Portuguese and Spanish, which is very exciting um, for me, of course. It was daunting for several reasons concerning both the subject matter within an extreme discipline of length and the intended audience. On subject matter, how could I select from and distill more than three decades of working in this area into 40,000 words and to do so in an accessible fashion? And that forced me to confront certain things. One was to reflect on how much aspects of my own work was inflected or shaped by very specific debates within materialist political economy, also known as Marxism, within my own institution, SOAS, and within the pages of the two journals with which I've been associated. Key themes, contexts, and moments of agrarian change from the classic transition from feudalism to capitalism in Europe, to the impact of colonialism on Latin America, Asia and Africa, to the formation and mutations of a global food economy in the period of industrial capitalism and then globalization, are strongly debated within Marxism, of course. And the second and third, the impact of colonialism the, the, the nature of a world food economy in the most recent period of capitalism are also much contested between Marxism and various currents of populism. 